Podcast. We demystify what goes on behind the therapy room door. Join us on this voyage of discovery and co-creative conversations. This is The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors Podcast, with Bob Cook and Jackie Jones. Welcome back to the next episode, episode 139 of The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors, with the wonderful Mr. Bob Cook, as always, and myself, Jackie Jones. And what we're going to be talking about this time, Bob, is when intimacy and closeness can be unsafe in the therapy room. Oh, gosh, that's a big subject. I'm glad I put my birthday jumper on for it. (laughs) My wife bought me this lovely jumper I've got now for this cold weather we've got. And um, it's it's one of my favourite jumpers. And when I'm thinking of this subject, empathy and nurture, uh, this jumper is very warm. But just say the title again so I've got it again. When intimacy and closeness can be unsafe in the therapy room. What a wonderful title. Yeah. And happens a lot, what we're talking about here, because I think therapists and counsellors and people listening to this podcast may vastly disagree with me, I don't know. But uh, I think that therapists or counsellors who believe that empathy um, and nurture uh is all that's needed for a successful outcome. I think they're very naive. Yeah. And I think therapists or counsellors who believe that um, empathy, nurture, uh, is the prerequisites for psychotherapy, maybe. But, you know, better way to look at all this, I believe, is that all clients that come in the room Will have their own unique histories yes and in somebody's unique history being vulnerable and allowing themselves to perhaps action their desire for closeness and intimacy might have been very dangerous in their history yes yeah yeah and they make may find it so hard uh, and rightly so given the context what just I've just explained here to be able to show any vulnerability that might lead to any closeness and intimacy with the therapist because the way they survived was exactly the opposite mm. and I th- it's our understanding of what intimacy and closeness means as well well, let's say a little bit more because I think this is the key. Yeah. Well, you know, intimacy can be potentially, you know, we can have sex and we can be in- intimate and things like that. Or being intimate is showing vulnerability of, you know, our upbringing and our past and being open to sharing and things like that. And the closeness aspect of it, bringing another person into our world can be seen as being intimate and close. Or not. Um, exactly. Or not. Yeah. That's because it's too dangerous. We, you know, when I do that, I get hurt. Yeah. So then, so the therapist that, or the naive therapist who thinks that every client that comes through the door has the capacity for, for, for intimacy and closeness, mm. I think is going down the wrong street. Yeah. Yes. And in fact, can lead to a therapist closing down completely. Yeah. Because again, depending on what what personality type they are, some clients dip in and out of contact, never mind, you know, intimacy and connection. Just the contact can be very hit and miss sometimes with some clients. Yeah. Let me tell you a story. Um, it came actually from uh, uh, a colleague of mine who I've known for many, many years, and we were discussing artificial intelligence. Oh, I love that. And about seven months ago, I was driving along in the car, and Channel 4, I think it was on the radio or something like Channel, must have been Channel 4, was talking about the advent of art- artificial intelligence. 
and um, was talking about using our robots with you know artificial intelligence to take the place of counselors or psychotherapists and why that hadn't happened um, extensively was because they were struggling with what developing what they called is the people uh, the, the uh, tech people um empathy chips yeah okay now let's go forward to where we are from last week when i was talking to my colleague he's from canada and he was talking about the fact that uh in a certain part of canada i don't know which part of it he was talking about they actually had started to replace some of the counselors with artificial with robots with artificial intelligence and had developed a so-called empathy chip wow and he was talking about this story about a, a robot stroke counselor who was working with somebody who was depressed and you know was displaying all the empathic transactions if you like and then the robot um, had a malfunction in other words it stopped yeah and it wasn't because they had the empathy check it was just because of something else and there, there all of a sudden the client was left without anyone because the robot had malfunctioned yeah and this client who had weeks and weeks and weeks of nurturing and empathy suddenly had a diet to starvation and they went away and killed themselves wow Hell. Yes, I think that's one area where I don't think robots or machines can ever take our place. <laughs> I think our jobs are quite safe for the future. Well, therapists are not all about empathy and nurturing. No. And I think, you, you know, confronting, setting boundaries, um, helping a person develop a new script on the road, isn't always about empathy and nurturing. In fact, it may be the opposite. Yeah, I think it's important to have a template of empathy and nurturing. Of course I do. But if you were just always going to give empathy and nurturing, and suddenly that you don't anymore for whatever reasons. Um, empathy and nurturing, for me, is quite triggering, to be fair. <laughs> do you want to say a bit more about that? I because... Agree. I didn't have it in my upbringing, so I I find it really uncomfortable. I don't actually know how to be around somebody that's really empathic and nurturing towards me. So it can be quite triggering for me. And therefore, it could be quite unsafe. Yeah, yeah. Because it would take you to a younger place uh, where perhaps things weren't so good. Absolutely. It, it can be quite, it feels quite manipulative to me when somebody's being very nurturing. It feels, yeah, manipulative. Another story for you, and then going back 30 odd years ago, um, I was, uh, this is before I married, so this would be 35 years ago, but I remember um, a colleague of mine, uh, another therapist, I was a young therapist, came to visit me and I had a house in, still in Manchester then, in uh, Fallowfield. And we walked up to the uh, Curry houses and the Curry Mile. And we had to go through some back end streets, if you like. So we were walking up there, it was night time. And suddenly, out of the blue, came four, at least three or four Black Mariahs. Do you know what they are? Yeah. They're police vans. Yeah. So it was just like a war zone in some ways. So dashing around and police was dashing out of their blue mariahs and they managed to grab hold of these two youths uh both of us was frozen on the spot looking at all this lot and then one of the police bundled the young lad into the black mariah and 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 the lad started fight going in so the policeman said do you want to go in the hard way or do you want to go in the soft way <laughs> and the guy said I want to go in the hard way because at least I know what I'm expecting then. Wow. Yeah. So when we talk about nurture, when we talk about empathy, the way you're talking about it, the usual response for people who've had that the type of history that you're talking about is what's the trick? Yeah. 
in other words all this empathy and nurture it's just a I, I'm going to expect I expect the worst I'm going to prepare myself for the worst this is just a maybe a trap yeah absolutely so when we're talking about it you know when intimacy and closeness can be unsafe in the therapy room it, it potentially is it feels unsafe to some clients <laughs> yes that's the point I'm making yeah and can we and can we and the client can reinforce even more their defensive coping mechanisms yeah which become more concretized and therapy will then take longer yeah yeah because it, it's it's kind of like the not the physicalness of being close to somebody as in the proximity it's what that closeness represents for Correct. us psychologically yeah Correct. absolutely if you've been start if you've been brought up in a meal of starvation yeah yeah it's hard then to get a full meal yes yeah yeah you won't believe it or your stomach has shrunk that's it you won't be able you won't be able to handle it absolutely yeah so yeah. you know the other side of it is being you know having the intimacy and the closeness physically in the therapy room and protecting ourselves against that Oh, professionally oh. yeah oh. and so it's okay to have a prerequisite or a template of empathy and nurture but there's a lot more to helping a person um with their developmental deficits their neglected history yeah. their toxic structure um you have to have different ways of attuning and involving yourself with clients yeah, because you touched on earlier on, I think you used the word vulnerable, being vulnerable and things. And I think, you know, if, if a client is being vulnerable in the therapy room, often it comes with shame. So, you know, they might have a, a session where they've opened up and they've been really vulnerable and everything. And then the next they come in and they're completely shut down and closed. I was listening to a, the new Robbie Williams documentary, which has come yes. on don't know if you've seen it or not. Yeah, yeah. I watched the first three out of the four episodes. And he was talking about shame. And he was talking about sometimes when he was on stage with 60,000 people in Nebworth or wherever he was, um, and he was having a panic attack or palpitations. Yeah. He, he would feel, well, not with the audience, usually after, he would feel a lot of shame yeah, because he triggered his own history. In fact, all the nurturing and the vibes and everything else um, at one level is very good, but when he's looking back at his history, often shame comes up. Yeah. And guilt. Yes, yeah. So when you're talking about nurturing and empathy and all these sorts of things, which are vitally important in the road of curative health, we must also remember that all individuals have unique histories. And you yeah. started your podcast in a very good way, which is what do we mean by intimacy and what do we mean by closeness? And for one person, it might mean X. Yeah. And for another person, it might mean Y. And we haven't even talked yet about the therapist counter transfers to intimacy and closeness. Yeah. Well, you know mine now. I I have a reaction to it. There we are. There we are. And what they mean by intimacy and what they mean by closeness and what they mean by vulnerability. Yeah. I think I always tend to check in with the client as well when when we've gone to a, a, a deep place where we are kind of crossing the boundaries of, you know, vulnerability and things like that to just check in and make sure we're, and not have an expectation that they're okay with it. Absolutely. You must, that is really, really important that you don't live in the world of assumptions. Yeah. Because if you live in the world of assumptions, then Therapy will invariably go down the wrong road. Yeah. 
and that's true. If yeah, you look absolutely. At the world of assumptions without this checking in that you're talking about and the phenomenological inquiry, therapy will invariably go down the wrong. I'll tell you which road it will take. It'll take the road the therapist wants the therapy to go down rather yeah. than a bilateral, attuned, involved um, therapy. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, the therapist is working with one contract and thinks they're working with another contract and the client is somewhere else completely. Yeah. And again, you know, I know I probably say this every second episode that we have. It's like the matrix in the therapy room. There are so many different levels and things that, we, you know, the, the, there's you in the room and then there's the client in the room and we've all got our own histories and, and everything. You know, and when you were talking about AI earlier on, all that I was thinking about was how can a robot read between the lines? Mm. Because often I think that's what I do in the therapy room. You know, what they're saying doesn't always match their body language. Mm. I think it's so important that we realise what you've just said, because you're right. It is a bit like the matrix in some ways. There's lots of little avenues we can go down, a lot of traps that have been set, yeah. a lot of testing that's been set. You know, we've got multiple selves in terms of parental interjects and younger parts of the self, and all this is going on at the same time. And somehow we need to stay connected as much as we can and involved as much as we can and inquire as much as we can so that we can stay at least in the same dimension yeah with the client yeah and that actually takes a lot of skill yeah i spent my first training for a very long time in transaction analysis years and years and years i don't know how long seven eight nine ten eleven probably at least 15 or 16 years before i learned the tools of inquiry involvement and achievement and thank goodness I did thank goodness I started to learn you know these uh tools to allow me to go to the developmental places I needed to go yeah uh, without them I'm not sure where I'd be in the matrix I do know something though if I live in the land of assumptions we'll go nowhere yeah yeah, I and think that's I, a really valid point. That that you do you know what I mean? I'm, I'm as you were saying that I was trying to think. I qualified in well, I started seeing clients in 2014, so it's nearly coming up to 10 years now. And I'd probably say that it's only the last couple of years that I've been okay to go deeper with clients. I think for the first two or three years at least, I only wanted it to be surface stuff. <laughs> You know, I found it difficult to go at deeper levels with them, confidence-wise, I think. Oh, oh I, I can certainly think that's true. And I went a long, long journey of a psychotherapy training process and a trainer until I met somebody who really showed me how to work at deep levels. Um, so, so I... I think it took, takes a long time to work out in the matrix where we both are. Yeah. Um, but, you know, empathy, well, where we started, right, you know, about empathy, nurturing, intimacy, closeness. It's not that they they can be unsafe traps, but I think it's really important that we see each client in front of us as a unique spirit with their own particular stories where intimacy and closeness was the last thing they desired or wanted mm. it might be what the therapist wants which is a different story altogether yeah 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 because i suppose at some point does our ego get in the way that we do want the client to be intimate and close in a psychological way because then it makes us feel like we're doing a good job <laughs> yeah or also we might believe but that's um, where a client needs to go and is a sign of health. Yeah. I mean, one of my belief systems is, is about contact. 
and how do we contact a person and how do we look for interruptions to contact why that's so important is i believe that contact or lack of content contact is a bit like oxygen without contact uh, ta words will say positive strokes or negative strokes people will go psychotic or they won't um, have a particularly healthy uh, process in life so is that equal to me intimacy and um, closeness no I don't think so I think I like to think about contact and how people find it hard to contact people or they may contact people through negative processes rather than positive processes and that's how they survived or didn't survive in life and we need to look at how we can contact people in an attuned involved way uh, which they can bear rather than turn away from yeah i think that's a really key point that it's not overwhelming for them yeah because if it's a, because if they start to feel overwhelmed they'll shut down yeah uh, and you might not even know they've shut down. Yeah. yeah. And I think as an ex-foster carer, that was one of the things that I became consciously aware of quite early on. <laughs> you know, that a lot of the looked after kids that we had, it, it was layers of protection. You know, they didn't want to be intimate or, or necessarily have a connection because one, they thought they were betraying the parents if they made a connection to me. But also, it was unsafe. In what way? Um, again, it's that thing that if you make a connection or you show a, a vulnerability, that it will be taken advantage of. Or you'll be tricked. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's a trick, somehow. Yeah. 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 And these are really important things for therapists to think about. And I think, you know, for, for me personally, I, I do respect people's protective mechanisms that they've put in place you know throughout their life i don't want to go in ramshod and try and break them all down <laughs> oh no i think that's probably the worst uh, thing that a therapist or counselor can do yeah because first of all who have you got who who are you to have the right to even do that absolutely and secondly it'll be a go against all the contracts you will have made and thirdly um, nothing will come of it except that you will help the client repeat history. Mm. And this, I want to say, ladies and gentlemen, is why therapy takes so long because we all have so many layers of protection that need to be surrendered. I don't know what, what the word is, but we need to work through them somehow, yeah. Yeah, for a developmental relational psychotherapy, the way we're talking, yeah, the therapy will take time. And when I mean time, I don't mean days, weeks, months. I mean more like years. Yeah. Yeah. But it's worth it, Bob. Priceless. Yeah. Absolutely priceless. And I think what we're talking about in this podcast is priceless. Yes. As well, actually, it's very yeah. important for therapists and counselors to think about when working with clients. Another wonderful one. I'm really looking forward to the next one, Bob. Oh, gosh. What is it? What is it, Jackie? This is a surprise, but it's <laughs> hypnotic induction in the therapy process. Oh, Jackie, another wonderful title. Oh, I wonder who thinks about them. No, most seriously, I I, I know I put this <laughs> this title in because, well, I won't take the thunder away from this podcast, but there's a lot to talk about. Yeah, and I I I'm really interested in this. And what's the second one? Uh, the second uh, one, or the week after, will be the importance for the therapist to think developmentally. Oh well, of course. That's a perfect podcast for me and you to talk about. But I'm looking forward to the hypnotic induction one, um, basically because it it was part of my training. Well, my third training, actually. And I found so much um, importance in it. So it's a really uh, important podcast. And I'm going to, I hope, hope both you and I, you know, find talking about this useful as well as the people who are listening to us. So I'm looking forward to that. 
I'll have to go to the recesses of my mind to see what comes up with the hypnotic induction bit. So (laughs) until next time, Bob. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. Take care. Yeah, take care. Bye-bye. Bye. You've been listening to The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors podcast. We hope you enjoyed the show. Don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review. We'll be back next week with another episode.